Can everybody hear me in the back all right? Yeah. Yeah. I love short and sweet, no bio intros, because it means I don't have to do any witty, witty banter. I can just get right into it. So we've got about 45 minutes, and I'm going to quiz the panel on quite a broad subject. And I'm hoping that we'll have 15 minutes or so for anybody that has more specific questions. So do try to hold that to the end, but there will be some time. Obviously, it's a, it's a, a, a broad subject and quite a heavy subject. In order to, to work through that, I'm going to try and break that down roughly into three areas, kind of breaking down in the starting with the beginning, moving towards the strategy as we look. I won't say recession because we're not officially in a recession, but in an economic downturn. And then move towards kind of strategies and how we avoid this planet becoming a fiery doom if we still want to maintain good returns. So I'm going to kick right off. And, and when we talk about sustainable investing, I've been within sustainable investing and on the periphery of it for probably over 20 years. And as a result of that, as with many of my panel, we generate some biases and, and sustainable investing means something differently to everybody in the audience when you talk about it. Um, I was around in the carbon markets when the global financial crisis hit and so sustainable investing got first impinged into me from the perspective of carbon. Later I focused on ESG and how we could uh, improve the way that we measured companies from the ESG perspective, which again created biases. But neither carbon finance nor ESG investing is sustainable investing. So, Will, turning to you first, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a loaded one, but if you could talk a little bit about your background uh, personally, demystify a little bit the concept of, of, you know, whether we include social investing, ethical investing, and come to more of a, a central term in, in five minutes on what is sustainable investing. I'll give it a go, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, in my day job, I run uh, a sort of large investment team, and it's our job to come up with kind of um, responsible uh, global exposure to the world economy. Sorry, global exposure, exp investment exposure to the global economy. Um, so, we've got economists, that's allocators, you know, people who are thinking about this all the time. Now, one of the things that sort of changed, I guess, over the course of the years is this idea that to start with, I think the initial expectation of responsible investing was that you would just leave certain companies out. Um, and the aim would be was essentially to, by punishing certain companies, by not giving them capital, you would force their funding costs up um, and therefore make them be behave better. You would create incentives to make them be greener, be better, and sort of, you know, help us all with our sort of environmental and other objectives. The problem, as always, I think, is one of this kind of perverse incentive ideas. And you and I were just talking about beforehand uh, the Cobra paradox. I think it's called and this is when in uh, when England, when Britain was sort of uh, in India and they decided in Delhi that they wanted to get rid of Cobras. And they turned around and said, look, we will give you money to the locals to Bring you dead, bring us dead cobras, um, and it started off by reducing the cobra population. But eventually, you started to get innovative uh, people bringing in, you know, buying cobras to kill them to give to the British, and then they collapsed the sort of the system of trying to, um, you know, give the locals money for cobras, and so your cobra population had doubled. So what you've got to think about, I think, is in terms of your outcomes. And there is quite an interesting paper, which I'd recommend all of you have a look at, from a Yale professor of finance called Kelly Shu. And she looked at the effects of depriving companies of capital. So what happens when a brown company, which is you know a polluter or an energy company or whatever, when its cost of capital goes up? Well, what you find is it becomes more short term. So actually, it becomes a worse pollutant. And so in a sense, like that forced a realization in the industry, I think increasingly, that you have to try and work with these companies somehow. Um, and that is, that's where the delta is going to come. That's where the real effect is going to come. Because actually, by giving cheaper cost of capital to already green companies, you're not going to make that much difference in many ways. Uh, you may make yourself feel better, but somehow you've got to make the less well-performing companies, the companies that are operating in difficult sectors, somehow you've got to bring them on the journey. And that is one of the sort of things that the modern responsible investing world is trying to solve. Yeah, and so you touched on a couple of things there. Obviously, the, the role of government, um, which we'll cover off a little bit later, also some of the unintended consequences of, of potentially good act, actions within sustainability. Lucy, I might turn that to you because, uh, you know, in your background working with corporates, you've seen the communication change and vary over time. 
Um, there's also the, the impact of, you know, of greenwashing across the board or potentially just, I, I, I was dealing with a hotel group one time that was showing incredible returns on their carbon performance in a certain business in India. Um, and they were reducing carbon year over year at a rate that nobody else was. And when they went to, to find out and run a big profile on it with this hotel group, it turns out that the manager in the company was actually just reading the energy meter and then dropping it by 20% because he didn't understand what he was talking about, right? So there's an education, there's an unintended uh, messaging from, from companies that are trying to seek investment. Maybe they're sustainable, maybe they're greenwashing. Can you talk about how that's changed over time? I can. Thank you, Steve. Hi, everyone, and delighted to join the panel. Um, so I'm Lucy, I'm the CEO of Futera, and Futera is a strategic consultancy, and um, we've been doing sustainability for 20 years now. And it, it's changed a lot in that time. So, uh, and what we do is kind of the logic and the magic. So the deep sustainability strategies, but also the communication. And that's quite a funny mix to have. Uh, so I want to I'll pull out a couple of things from your question there, Steve, in, in, from these two perspectives. So for example, we work with Formula One. We took Formula One um, back in 2018. We helped them set their net zero goal. So. That was quite a change, you know, <laughs> to have someone like F1, you know, petrol heads, noise, glamour, still at that point had the the women, you know, in, in the pits, basically, or glamorous. That was something that had to go as well. So Formula One um, setting their net zero target, which, which, which was a, a big change for industry in general. Um, I think it was... Oh, Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth has said, if Formula One can net, go net zero, then anyone can. And net zero is when you say that by 2050, you'll have, you're decarbonized. You'll have pulled down your greenhouse gas emissions by about 90%, and you've got to be halfway there by 2030. Uh, lots of people have set these goals. Not everyone's making them at the moment. Uh, but we also do the story. Uh, which is going to be crucial in how we're going to get there. Now we're going to circle back to that. So, you know, for example, we've entered this thing called swishing, just glam clothes recycling parties. And I've been on the BBC talking about swishing for years. So we do this logic and magic. And what I've seen change, um, there, there, is, there is an utter fear from the businesses we work with at the moment in saying anything about sustainability. Um, everything is getting triple, I mean, the most enormous internal checks, the ESG uh, backlash in the States, the Wokarati, all that lot that people are worried about. Um, so that's changed. But what we also see is some businesses really doubling down in this space. And actually over and above net zero, what really counts here just take it big picture for a moment, is parts per million. So actually in tackling climate change, which sustainable investment is obviously set up to serve, forget about the 1.5 degree temperature change. I mean, even Europe's bust through that at the moment. It's parts per million and 350 parts per million is the safe operating environment for all of us. And we're set to get about to about 426 in 2025. So really visionary businesses are thinking we need to make net zero, but also what else? How do we innovate? How do we sell these solutions that are ready and ripe for investment? How do we provide ground source heat pumps or whatever, you know, computer and um, consumer end use of electrification? And so before I hand over, I just want to spend a moment on what's really needed for this parts per million is this enormous, exciting redo of our economies. We need massive electrification. And even those sectors which are really hard to do with sustainable investment, the hard to abate sectors, that's cement, hydrogen, what they need is massive amounts of energy. So we need a huge push into renewables as part of this electrification. And just a, a story before I close here. So many moons ago, we were hired by Greenpeace to try and get their energy forecasts uh, into The Economist. Now, this was, oh, guys, about 12 years ago. And uh, right then, the language was very much the energy mix, alternative, uh, and you know, very much a feeling of, oh, it doesn't sound very safe and secure. I definitely shouldn't put my money there, all alternatives. So our, 
our task was to reframe renewables as renewables rather than alternatives. And so we had <laughs> we had Greenpeace on the phone planning to bring their ship, you know, into Amsterdam and, you know, oh God, so many calls with mean Greenpeace people. I say, well, you know, what do you want to take the Oriana somewhere else? Greenpeace, much meaner than the investment community. It'd be like, that's the most <laughs> fucking ridiculous <laughs> idea I've ever heard. It's like, caller, sorry, who is this from the Greenpeace team? <laughs> So, you know, we've got, we've, we've done the rounds at Futera. We've kind of seen where the bodies are buried. But what I have, what I, in actually having a look at some of the stats on investment in clean energy and kind of prep for this, what I was delighted to see is that the International Energy Agency, who's basically who we were trying to reach with this, is to get them to, you know, talk about their forecasts in a way that sounds like they're, you know, this whole thing is investable in. I mean, honestly, to prep for this, I could have just read out the uh, the IEA's latest news release. It's about how much there is investment in renewables, how solar is outstripping oil for the first time, um, mass, you know, heat pumps, all the rest of it. But, and I know we're going to come back to this, there's also a rebound effect. So we've all, you know, 1.7 trillion is invested in energy, clean energy, still 1 trillion in oil and gas, which is what we need to be moving out from. But why is this rebound effect happening is I think the interesting thing. But I'll stop there because I know we're coming back to that. Perfect, thanks for that. And uh, you alluded to opportunities for investors within the, the downturn and I, I think kind of turns the, the kind of bias of this conversation on, on its face, right? That, that many assume that there's a negative correlation between impact investing and returns. Saw today um, another stat on on investors flooding away from ESG, and we've talked about how ESG isn't necessarily sustainable investing. But I think the the bias is created by that, and uh, and we expect that's on the basis of of returns. Tom, can you talk a little bit about about that, and also how, as an investor, just in in general, you might shift your focus to look at opportunities. And I know you've been involved in this space for many years, and and whether that be in, in a boom or bust, talk a, a little bit about, about the strategies that investors can, can take. Yeah, sure. So on, on the idea of a trade-off between impact and returns, um, it, I think it's kind of maybe an outdated way of uh, considering what the investment opportunities in sustainability as a broad term really are. Um, from, so I'm from Han ETF, and we're an ETF issuer, so we create um, thematic ETFs uh, and various other niche ETF RTC strategies. And the demand or interest we're seeing from investors and when we talk to them is not an idea that they're going to invest in, say, a solar energy ETF on the basis of, of impact. They're not trying to invest uh, to, to lower the cost of capital of solar energy producers or equipment makers. They're investing because they're looking at stuff like what uh, Lucy was talking about in terms of the, the massive transformation of the global economy towards net zero. Uh, the idea that um, obviously the United States has is, is unleashed a huge wave of, of investment with the Inflation Reduction Act. You've got the EU Green Deal. And so investors are not looking at it in terms of they, they could even be climate skeptics themselves what they're looking at is the idea that actually um th this solar uh is going to play an increasing role in terms of the global energy mix and and it, it presents a, a growth opportunity to invest in o obviously um people can take a different view and therefore they might still wish to invest in oil and gas etc um, but that won't be based on the idea that they're chasing returns or those investing in oil and gas and, and those investing in solar, renewable, or even nuclear, uranium, whatever, electric vehicle makers are, are doing so because they, they, they're just trying to do good. They're, they're looking at what they, what they think the growth of these markets and these industries and sectors are. This, this brings to something I want to dive a little bit deeper in. And, and Will, you and I had a conversation beforehand and we talked a bit about collective capitalism um, and market-based drivers towards, towards sustainable investing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And then uh, I'd love to hear, you know, particularly from a Barclays perspective. Obviously, Barclays has been, been under the, the light particularly around, around oil. Um, first, talk a little bit about the concept of collective capitalism. And, and then I'd, I'd like to, to hear your thoughts um, on investment in kind of traditional laggard sectors where you might either influence those laggards or find leaders within the sector. So, I mean, it's two great questions in there, Stephen. So, I mean, I think collective capitalism, I mean, it, it, it's a sort of summary idea from what started to, the most obvious example, I guess, is during the pandemic, um, when you had the world's biggest asset managers get together and say to the pharmaceutical stocks on their books, don't compete, collaborate, come up with a vaccine. Now, 
to me, that's relatively uncontroversial. We all wanted, or most of us wanted a vaccine, and it was a sort of, you know, it was a good idea. The problem you get to a little bit is the idea of taxation without representation. You know, we've got to assume at this stage that the owners or the leaders, the chief executives of these asset managers, do they have to be benign people? Do they have to share our objectives? They're not elected. So how can we trust that these guys are, you know, in a world which, you know, we can mostly disagree on whether the color gray is the color gray. Um, it's quite hard to find kind of shared objectives and shared ideas about what we want to achieve. And so I worry a little bit about the power that you're putting in asset management's hands, you know, the masters of the universe idea. Do they have to be benign? And they don't. You know, we could have an evil chief who puts us in the wrong direction. So I, I do worry a little bit about that. In terms of sort of more on the kind of return side, you know, in a way, like, make a great point. You know, there's a there's a sort of uh, return in itself, which you know you are hoping to do some good for a start. It's not just about you know the financial returns, but also you are getting into a world now where that is more tangible because of the emergence of impact investing. You know, the idea that you don't just have to not invest in the companies you find disreputable or whatever. That actually you can now <laughs> choose an objective and actually try and make money about it by providing capital to it. So that's a much more sort of a positive development in my opinion. But the idea, it's very difficult to disentangle kind of the returns to responsible investing versus all sorts of other factors that are driving investment. So you can turn around and say that cleaner companies have done phenomenally well or ESG investments have done phenomenally well over the last decade. But how do you disentangle that from the fact that growth stocks are huge in ESG and have had a boom for this last decade so do you know what I mean there's there's well, all sorts and, and of other factors how do you going measure on. it as well right there's obviously the, the financial performance but you know and, and to the point of, of, of Lucy beforehand right it just because a company sits within uh, sustainalytics climate leaders perspective doesn't you know I saw um, Exxon Valdez sit as a, as a climate leader Absolutely. you know because of the way that they were reporting I mean, so this so, is that point that the, the is it Sir Ronald Cohn makes about sort of you know having properly audited, you know, impact accounts that account for not just the direct business, but everything you do as a company so that we can evaluate them holistically relative across sectors, but we're not there yet. And also the, um, the net zero, the kind of the greenhouse gas inventory framework got nobbled by the um, energy companies for a while. It's kind of uh, refit, it's re redone the science-based targets, which has helped to solve that but there is um the kind of scope three emissions for energy companies weren't counted originally so that would mean anything the the fuel that we burn for example didn't get counted so yeah i mean i i, I would pick up on this piece around the um uh you know the uh, what why people do what we do the, the framework in which we're operating i think is really crucial here um because the so we've developed this new bit of thinking at Futera which I'm going to try out on you I haven't, I haven't it's his first outing for me so bear with me. <laughs> um and and part of it is because you asked this question about communications and um increasingly it's great that we've got more greenwash guidance and that it's much more I mean basically what's happening with green claims is that they're all going to get funneled into an EU structure here for example and they'll be very little wiggle room for things that you can say or not say. Um, but if we think that in order to move these capital allocations to get people investing in things, we've got to, we've got to persuade people it's a good thing. Communication itself is, is going to help us here, but it's, it's, it's stalling. And actually, um, one of the things we've seen is that just comms isn't enough. We need to really think about culture and uh, how, uh, and actually, so this is the new thinking coming, if, if policy is at the top of the triangle and we spend all our time, and I absolutely agree, the Inflation Reduction Act, the EU Green Deal has been awesome for driving change, but we've still got these rebound effects and we've still got everyone up in arms about the ULEs and, you know, there's, there's, it is, it's not a done deal. So you've got policy at the top, uh, which relies on structures. So, um, institutions, policymakers, um, religion, finance, f finance systems, all the rest of it. And that relies 
our theory is on stories, the stories that we tell ourselves, stories, what we see on TV, what Hollywood's making, the cultural piece that we take in actually drives what we think about things so much. And often the story, and linking back to the title around this, is it feels like it's threatening your 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 livelihood, the, the way of doing things. Like when I'm talking about huge excitement, you know, reworking the economies, lots of people think, oh, that sounds really awful. And will I, will I be worse off? Or will my investments do badly? Or are my kids going to be okay? So, so all of that, if you kind of look, go down again, you've got policy, um, system, society, stories, and actually all of that is basically about how we feel as people. And the only things that really matter to us about how we feel as people is our brain chemicals, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins. I mean, think about it, that's what drives everything, right? So, so we've got to find a way of laddering up by you know, telling stories that give us this kind of feel good return. The stories then helping with the structures and everything going up to policy. But if we just try and change policy, it, it, it goes against our desire for safety, status, self-worth. So all it's, and I mean, our shortcut is we've got to work with the entertainment industry basically to tell, <laughs> to tell a new story on this because, you know, that just but, relying on companies to brand message on this is, is not going to cut it. But th this is more an open question to the group. I, I highlighted stories and, um, you know, one of the issues that I, I take, for example, with uh, the current way that, that this is, is managed and measured is through ESG reporting. Right. And often that story is just the best story that a company can put forward. And many companies that I've interviewed are just hiring more and more on their sustainability team to go dig the good stories out, like that guy that was checking the meter reading in, in, in his company in, in India. Big question to the group from a financial perspective is who's responsible for policing that? And, and, and I'll open that to anybody that wants to take that. Is it the responsible, uh, responsibility of something like UXIF, you know, in, in, from an NGO perspective? Is it a market-driven approach? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on, on where we actually get those stories to be not just stories, but facts. And, and I understand your, your message on stories is slightly different, but a company's stories, as we look as investors, how do we determine that what they're telling doesn't just disappear in, in a week or two when it's not the right story anymore. Tom, thoughts? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a complex question and, and maybe not one I can and a fully answer. Um, uh, does he have different competing ways to measure ESG, different methodologies from whether it's say analytics or Morningstar or MSCI and the correlation between those is, is, is uh, sometimes tricky uh, or rather not correlated. Um, uh, and at the same time, um, there's a, a subjectivity around also inclusion in ESG, uh, the E, in theory, can be fairly um, objective. Uh, the G in theory can be, although that's not necessarily <laughs> the case. But the, then the S becomes tricky itself in terms. Of, so if you're having a uh, state-led kind of uh, what is uh, what's kind of activities are um, not permissible in an ESG sense, uh, what labour practices? These are obviously you have the state decide labour practices, but you, you reach a certain level of subjectivity. Uh, at least from the kind of using these screens perspective. Um, one investor might not necessarily agree that defense stocks are automatically not ESG. Uh, another investor will wholeheartedly believe that such a stock should never be in, in an ESG portfolio. And, and so there's a level of subjectivity which is probably, uh, it, it will never be solved in, in terms of kind of getting a one standard definition of, of how to apply such a uh, quantitative method. Uh, so it's going to have to be market driven and, and uh, yeah. So market driven is the key there. Will, do you have thoughts yeah, on that? We use, we use this sort of consultant slash attack dog uh, yeah. who comes in and, and and what we we do is we do exactly what I was discussing earlier. We try and come up amongst our shareholders with agreed objectives and we target the companies on our books and they look very specifically at this consultant that we use. They look very specifically at what is stated and they try and uh, husband some of the sort of efforts and they see where they're not realistic. They keep them to their uh, to their sort of promises on our behalf. And we then, uh, on a regular basis, they report to us 
and then we have to report into organizations like the Financial Reporting Council or various other things because we're signatories of the stewardship code. So there's a sort of ecosystem which should over time become self-reinforcing to a certain extent because you should have you know reputational risk, genuine objectives, genuine you know wants to do better, uh, all kind of aligning at the best. That, that's how it should work in time. And so far it's been a sort of good, there's been lots of good examples and we've seen plenty of examples from the companies around, you know, that we own around the world, from sort of Fanuc in Japan all the way to sort of SSE in the UK, whether it's kind of board representation or, uh, you know, supply chain organization and how you do that and so on. So that's, you know, it takes a lot of forensic work. Um, and then there's a kind of, you know, there's a outside of that ecosystem, there's a kind of private sector effort, whether it's media, and that's kind of the point of free media, all these other sort of, you know, NGOs and various organizations trying to keep this whole system honest because, and that gets back to the point about, you know, in a way we were discussing before that you've got to see yourself as the best possible owner for that company. If you're a shareholder, it's your responsibility to do it because if you hand that responsibility off to someone else, are they going to have the same objectives that you have? And I think that's kind of one of the important thing to sort of realize is that the more you push company ownership into the kind of fringes and more desperate areas, that's when it becomes less responsible, less, you know, So uh, I, I, I think, think. Sorry, did you have something? I was going to say there is a problem with the divestment piece, which I'm fully behind, but the problem is that you can get these, you know, coal power stations yeah. almost turning up as dark assets to be it, traded. This by. is where I was going to go. Oh, the, right. yeah, you yeah. Know, the subsidiaries get pushed out or, you know, you get a lot of self-congratulation from the top and yeah. and these assets uh, these assets get, get moved. Right. Yeah. But it's one of the problems with this Kelly Shoe paper, funny enough, that I mentioned earlier, is that the way you measure sort of carbon intensity relative to revenues, what that does is it encourages certain firms to sort of buy big retail operations to put next to their, you know, their polluting businesses so that it looks like they're yeah. cleaner, but so in reality, doesn't, doesn't there's no change. Doesn't that just fly it's into identifying yeah. risks, right? You know, you, you take a, so an example like, like Boohoo, we, and I think we talked about it, right? You know, local high street brand, um, where from the perspective of their reporting, they were a Sustainalytics and, and MSCI leader, they were submitting all of their reports. There was no fraud committed with regards to what they were submitting. Aberdeen Standard and their key investors were all happy, but you were buying fancy dresses for two, two pounds on the high street, right? There was, there was some issues that were potentially there hiding in plain sight that would argue that nobody wants to see, right? Now, how do you try to identify, and can you you've, um, highlight some of the risks that, you know, we, we talked as well about the role of the corporation is a, a, as a listed company, to maximize returns, kind of the, the Henry Ford thought. How do you square that in order to maximize returns but and identify risks? Can you, for the group, talk a bit a bit more about some of the risks that you might be using to identify? Is it just the, the risk of public exposure in the media, the risk of getting caught, or is there more to it? I mean, I, I think in a way, like if you take the kind of, you know, the that really controversial Milton Friedman article and sort of say, look, you know, the only responsibility of a business is to make profits. You know, you can add in long-term profits because if you're going to be a global corporation, let's just take any sort of, you know, generalized company, you're going to have a global customer base to sort of take a, an example within that. If you're going to effectively sell to a global customer base, then you're probably best having a globally representative workforce, equal opportunities for all. So you can take it to that extreme, but I personally think that there needs to be the guiding hand of regulators and so on in order to sort of set the rules of the game. We're having this at the moment. You know, look at you know Alphabet antitrust in the U.S. Are all of the effects good just because you can't see it in prices? No. Right. You know, there's clearly. And poor externalities coming and, from some of these and, companies. And housing and, and uh, waterways in the UK yesterday. Absolutely, right? so, yeah. And so, so you've, got to, you've got to have some way of seeing this as it comes up. And But it, it's a very, it's a difficult balance to find and it's always evolving. Well, and, and if it's... You, oh, sorry, I was going to ask a question no, as well. Do you, with um, 
because everyone's hopping at the moment, aren't they, about CSRD um, and CSDD. Uh, so one is the new reporting, basically Europe, Europe is legislating for sustainability and a green deal. <coughs> And two of the big, there's lots for consumer protection. Um, that's where a lot of the greenwash stuff is coming out of. But there's also around uh, reporting um, and mandatory disclosure. And so there's a lot coming, isn't there, on human rights and you're reporting on that, climate and you're reporting on that. Is that, I imagine that's going to make life easier ultimately in terms of... I mean, in terms of, I, I, it'll have a lot of unintended consequences in some ways, because if you look at responsible investing now, what was an investing activity is now becoming a regulatory document mm, production yeah, yeah, activity. Yeah, yeah. And we now have within Berkeley's not just a legal department, but an ESG legal department mm. as well. And so that starts to rule out smaller companies to mm. a certain degree that can't have the scale to have these separate departments to be able to do that. So. I, I, the intention is good, and, and you know yeah, the direction yeah. of travel is good. But yeah. I sort of wonder but what you may the be less is. likely to disclose. You know, particularly, you know, we, we saw conversations about should there be custodial sentences <laughs> for Southern Water, yeah. right, for raw sewage being, being leaked. So, you know, I, I think, with all due respect to the current government or any government that I've, I've sat with, if, if that's the role of policing this, I think we're all heading for ultimate doom. So, are there <laughs> are there other ways that this can be influenced and we talked about this you know what could be the role of 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 companies or or funds with a lot of fire firepower you know we've we've looked at the norwegian pension funds for example and and their um you know government backed strict uh, accordance on exclusions um what uh, maybe tom or to the group what is, are some of the top down ways that we can see change within this sector that move it forward uh, well, I, I think it comes back to, to what we were saying in terms of the big asset managers um, kind of using their firepower for these ends. It, it does start to become controversial, and that's part of the ESG backlash in America. Mm -hmm. Much of you might agree with Larry Fink's view on, on the climate. Right. Not everyone does. And, and, and so you, when you have, and there's a new book out, uh, John Coates, The Power of 12, about the concentration of ownership from uh, the, the big index fund houses in the U.S., and it does afford them an extraordinary amount of power and therefore ability to to affect these changes. But it it does raise questions about should uh, should should these uh, companies have have that power to to the extent where they're kind of creating policy and regulation in 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 a way which we would perhaps be uncomfortable with, uh, given their their ability to do so. Owning, I think, um, kind of stat forgot the stat, but. Uh, Average S&P 500 company, about 20% is owned by by one of the big index houses now, and so that gives boards an enormous amount of power, which can be used for good. But then at the same time, you know, they're, they're they're just entities which which have a leadership which is not necessarily chosen, and and we're relying on the goodwill of, of Larry Fink. Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to see something um, picking up on your point there about because I do actually agree, and everyone's hopping around CSRD, but increased. You know, real-time disclosure using AI, uh, great. Uh, increased and increased and increased reporting, a lot of effort, not always much change. Um, but, uh, and also we've got this issue, I can touch on it earlier, that the um, the accounting frameworks for climate greenhouse gas reduction are reductive. So by which I mean that if you had a set of inventory and you're making boilers, and then you decide to come out of boilers and go into ground source heat pumps, but your um, y y y it, there was more energy required to make those ground source heat pumps. Your you get a worse score. Your greenhouse gas emissions go up, despite the fact that you're selling a product which is an electrification product and which is overall going to reduce everyone who's using it um, climate emissions. So the system at the moment isn't really set up to serve innovation, or yeah. certainly in the way of rewarding innovation. And there's a framework being developed at the moment under WBCSD, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You know that you've been working in sustainability for a long time when you can say WBCSD. Um, <laughs> so there's a system being set up at the moment, which is, is wonky at the moment, but it's, it's gathering traction. It's got a huge amount of attention from the big corporates, the Fortune 500, Fortune 100s. It's called the Avoided Emissions Framework. And it's looking at how you can start to account and ultimately reward those who are innovating to find solutions 
to the solutions economy, basically, to yeah. bring down climate emissions. I really think that's the key. Um, right. yeah, it's, it's technology has to be the answer, so you've got to find capital going to the people trying to solve these problems, yeah. rather than people just wash, washing them away. Which yeah. I think yeah. is well, well, come across as a salesman, but we do have an ETF for our ETF, which is... Uh, oh, they're quite delicious. Yeah. Uh, you do not. Yes, it's the... Good marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Now, you might... I'll, 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 uh, I'll show you the ETF. Uh, to see <laughs> that very and good see what you think of the methodology. <laughs> it's, it's just important you make about the heat pump aspect because right. um, with, say, a clean energy index, uh, so S&P Global Clean Energy Index, if you look at the um, carbon intensity of that index using uh, carbon revenue, uh, but the other metrics too, uh, it, it has a higher carbon intensity than the S&P 500. Right. And so, it, you know, but at the same time, this is technology uh, crucial, uh, crucial to... to yeah. So we're planet. exposing yeah. opportunities in sustainable investing here on the panel. So, wow. um, <laughs> this, Lucy, I know you're 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 down with the youth. What about uh, what about the the role of the next generation, right, in in actually driving change? Ah, uh, okay. Um, and what is this generation called? I'm not up. Oh uh, well, uh, alphas, are the alphas, new ones. Right. Um, so when I was at uh, TED Countdown, which was in the run-up to um, Glasgow COP, um, there was a big delegation of youth activists there, and and uh, they were part of the Stop Cambo um, oil, Stop Cambo new oil field um, piece, and they uh, were on the stage with um, then Shell CEO Ben Vivian. Uh, all kind of moderated by Christina Figueres, the chief negotiator uh, for the UN um, Paris Agreement. And um, they left the stage. They wouldn't share the stage with the CEO of Shell. And I was interested because the TED countdown is all the sustainability kind of glitterati. And everyone was a bit like, oh, a bit flouncy of them, wasn't it? Oh, they should have <laughs> stayed on stage. And and it was a, it was a, a moment of like the generational divide of like me and the sustainability. Well, I was more on their side, but it was like they just didn't get it that the youth activists who have driven an enormous amount of corporate change, the way that they've changed the narrative around this, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, has been a sea change even for the corporate space. Um, they don't want to be on stage with that they see and this how far do you want to go with this yeah they see these folks as they'll be treated as war criminals in the future like that yeah. is the strength of the feeling yeah. that's going on it's ideological driven change, so much of this yeah. change so. well and, and i think i think we've talked about it in the past as well i think within those in the sustainability community it's almost like a a fourth wall enacting that everybody sits together and doesn't permeate out and thinks they're doing a good job. But the reality is that there's 80% of the populace that exists on the outside of it that, you know, maybe do their recycling and that's about it. So a groundswell of, of change is, is going to be, be an important one. I'm mindful that everybody wants to, to have a, a beer or two, but I want to open it up to any of the group for questions. Otherwise, I have have a few more of my, my own. So anybody, um, I think there'll be some microphones floating around. Um, it's kind of across the board if, if you, you're struggling to to understand what is sustainable investing we can delve into that a little bit deeper if you have more specific questions around specific strategies or thoughts on uh, on how things are going to change I'm, i think we're open to that so just up front here i've got such a loud voice as well i think everyone will hear me um yeah I was just interested to know a little bit about, you've, you've touched upon auditing. Um, who do you think, this is a global problem that we're facing if we focus on the environmental piece of ESG. Um, do you think there should be more of a supernatural um, government body that should be um, addressing some of these issues, but more importantly, auditing? Um, it's, it feels like that was a big theme in, in the panel discussion, so I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And also, sorry, I've taken some notes, impact investing. Um, you mentioned um, that was, I, I think it was um, William that mentioned impact investing at the beginning of the conversation. 
Um, I'd love to know a little bit more CMC markets where I work is, um, you know, uh, we offer financial, um, uh, you know, venues for clients. Uh, and I know that a lot of our peers um, and, and clients actually are asset managers, fund managers. How does impact investing improve, you know, ESGs in general? And uh, if you could focus a little bit more about that. Yeah, of course, yeah. um, on the auditors, just quickly. So, I think the problem, and I, this is not an area of specialty. I mean, I think I, I would advise. There was a great lecture given by Sir Ronald Cohen on the LSE podcast. Really interesting. And he's kind of been leading the charge on this front. And I, but my personal suspicion is that creating a new global body would take too much time. It's a more urgent problem than that in a way. And it's partly driven at the company level and it's partly driven by regulatory requirements, I suspect. Then your auditing, I would almost be tempted to use the existing auditing framework, but just having incentives within those auditors to have specialists focusing on that particular area. But there's just, yeah, you're starting to see companies be a bit more holistic about how they report lots of metrics that we're looking for, but you need, you know, commonality so that I could compare an investment in a bank with a, you know, with another company looking at our employment practices, you know, just looking holistically at what a company does and its imprint on the environment. Uh, um, and, I, and I think the cynics view would mean more money just to the big four on the auditing side rather than, you know, trying to achieve a, a regulatory framework across the globe when we had so yeah. much di difficulty with, with too tariffs. Much time. Too, much time. too much time. Yeah. Um, I also, it, it, sorry to steal that, I want to hear your second point, but I also read a good book on kind of the argument against globalization by a guy called Jared Diamond, which looked at a book called Collapse. And the actual need for different markets to maintain their own pockets as an island, rather to have a group think around this. So yeah. a global standard might not necessarily be the best place for people to, to see the, the change happening. I agree. Yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and you're seeing that now, to be honest, in terms of how people are treating, you know, things like you can almost think about treatment of data, you know, in China, Europe, and the US, sort of very different interpretations. You need to have sort of cultural norms taken into account to be immediately effective, I think, rather than having a global kind of one size fits all, even though it is a global problem. Um, on the impact investing, there are all sorts of resources you can look at. Um, it's, it's growing in size and influence all the time. Um, it's one of the more exciting to areas in investment, I think. It's still small relative to ESG in terms of total assets invested. But what you're finding now is that from a client perspective, because there's so much demand for it, quite a lot of it is happening through private equity at the moment, but there's still there's a growing amount of public market stuff for the masses, I think, because a lot of private equity is just not appropriate in many ways for smaller investors. And I think the next step is that you get much bigger availability for this stuff, but not at the expense of its credibility, because at the moment it's one of the more exciting areas. But as with financial markets generally, if you start seeing lots of financial capital seeking stuff, then as we saw with greenwashing, people just start to come up with stories that might fit their narrative <clears throat> as such. I, I will add to that for th that point that there's, there's some organizations now that would be useful for you. So. Globally, there's what's called SIFs, which were sustainable investment in finance. The UK has the largest chapter, the UK SIF, uh, globally with, I think, something like 11 trillion assets under management. Now, that's tools around sustainable investment that tend to hit at the top level, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, that sort of thing. But I've also seen a groundswell of the same sort of programs down to the earliest levels, even from a venture capital perspective. So there's there's tools across the board for investors to understand what sustainable investment mean and to develop strategies around that. So, uh, question here and then two at the back. Maybe if, if you want it, yeah, please just, that's perfect. I think you might need a microphone for the recording. Oh, for the recording, yeah. sorry, yeah. Good one, Jay. <laughs> Hi. Um, to be effective, do you think we need to prioritize the E, S, and G? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
do you mean should we prioritize one out of the others? Uh, um, it's, hmm, it's quite a philosophical question. I mean, it, I, I could hmm, really stop me. Um, I, it depends on where you're driving. If if you are, if you have a fire in your belly that climate change is the thing that needs solving, and it is because it makes everything else worse. Equity and social systems all suffer when climate change or parts per million go up, then you might laser focus in on the E. But the, your question about like the youth, for example, I, I believe, I'm not youth, but I believe <laughs> the desire is to see much more on the S and the belief that actually if you don't do this in an equitable manner, um, you're not going to get where you, you're going to get somewhere different. You're not going to get where you want to go. So that's, sorry, that's not really a corporate or an investment answer, but just a kind of where, I feel, you know, where, where people tend to fall passion wise, I think. Can I just say, no, you go. Yeah, it's, I, I think, uh, at least from an investment perspective, the, the E already is emphasized. Um, when investors <laughs> or, or financial promotions, marketing material, talk about ESG, they're using it often as shorthand for sustainability, et cetera. So, the E is already emphasized and the, the G and the S are, are not so talked about at, in most contexts. So it's already there, whether it's the best uh, approach, I, I don't know, but, um, and probably is one of the arguments to stop using the term ESG to mean everything and anything, because it's not helpful in terms of what ESG is actually made for. Can, can I just introduce something problematic and it's not necessarily kind of entirely accurate, but it could be. And it's, it, we've lived through a little bit of it that, you know, who, which households in this country, in the US, and all of the developed world, who has the highest, as a proportion of their household income, expenditure on energy and food? It's the lowest parts of the income distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get rich investors turning around and saying, well, I'm not going to fund energy companies or anything like that, and I'm not saying that we should fund energy, I'm just giving an example, I don't want any more new oil projects. If you don't do anything else, then who pays the price for the transition? The poorest parts of society. Is that acceptable? I don't think so, personally. Do you know what I mean? So I, it requires, and I think that's why, you know, and you made this point earlier, that ESG, in a sense, is reductive. It's an incredibly complex set of challenges that we're facing from biodiversity to climate to inequality to, you know, you could even throw in the opioid epidemic in the US and all these areas of real difficulty. And it takes complicated thought, not marketing messages. And I think that's what financial services has been bad at so far, is that they've thought that this is a new way to sell stuff, and therefore it's been this kind of greenwashing trend. And that, I think, is the wrong way to go. These are complex issues that are interrelated, uh, and they require complex solutions. It, uh, it's a great question, but I think by prioritizing, you are paving the way for unintended consequences. Right, so ESGs, I think we all, all agree, are, are very limiting. The sustainable development goals were designed to cover across a broader remit, but most people don't know that the sustainable development goals were designed to be delivered from a systems perspective, that you can't improve life below C without improving carbon or at least recognizing the risks. So I think if you are going to prioritize, because you know I agree with Lucy that certainly carbon is, is something that comes to my mind first, then you at least better be identifying the risks associated with overlooking the S or the G or uh, security and, and um, was another one that people add occasionally to, to ESG. Had a question here. Thank you. Um, oh, good evening. So I'm an economist and I was promised a discussion on um, <laughs> investing in the times of recession. Uh, thank you so much for going much deeper into, into the, uh, the argument than that. But I do have to ask you please to come back to the surface. Um, so, uh, there are two major macroeconomic factors that are driving returns in equities and fixed income at the moment. One of them is the risk of growth staying too weak for too long, and the other one is the risk of commodity prices staying too high and interest rates staying too high for too long. Is sustainability a diversifier or a diversifier? Great um, question. I, I, I am going to, uh, I hope, answer. I, I'm going to quite, I think 
sustainability is dealing with the same issues. So you remember I mentioned that uh, IEA press release earlier. That was very helpful. Uh, it was really clear what's holding back, where you've got this uh, rebound effect, um, the fossil fuels and the fact that you've got um, uh, uh, the investment in clean energy isn't evenly spread. Um, it is high interest rates. It is uh, unclear policy frameworks and market design. It's weak grid infrastructure. It's financially strange utilities and high cost of capital. So I don't, I, I, I was actually trained as an economist as well. <laughs> so I don't know if I have the answer to your question. I think that investment in this area is facing the same constraints as everything else. And that if you want to change the policy, which should give clearer market signals, which would at least enable uh, more capital allocation to the good stuff, then again, my piece is you need to come back to changing the story, the system, the operating thing in order to enable that policy change to happen. So I don't know whether it makes it worse or better. I think it's facing the same issues as, as, as everything else is. I've too much to say. I'm sorry. Well, and this it's is a really a interesting thing. question. It, it, it is, and, and we well. probably could have spent the whole panel on this. But the, 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 you could say that all of the things are linked in economic terms. So you could say, for instance, that you know there's been a self-reinforcing effect for the last several decades with ever lower real interest rates that has created corporate titans that have given have managed to stretch out too much of a lead relative to the rest of corporate world. And that has been a disincentive to research and development, which is the key to sorting out all of the problems that we face, productivity, R&D incentives. So higher real interest rates, more genuine competition. That may be one of the answers. And actually, you know, if you look at sort of the incoming batch of technologies, you know, one of the possibilities you know, with regards to generative AI in particular, is that if you're looking at the effects on, you know, inequality, for instance, you know, that it's actually lower skilled workers that get the biggest productivity boost there. And you're looking at Alphabet in the US at the moment and the federal uh, government sort of having a look at competition through more than just price, you know, and you've got central bankers raising real inter raising interest rates and real interest rates higher anyway. It may be that the answers are all the same sort of broad piece. Yeah. That's maybe a bit pat, but it's one thing I hope for anyway. And maybe investment by the state as well, the magic card idea. Precisely. We're going to get back to that China story. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so yeah. actually you know, now you're starting to see industrial policy because people are arguing yes. that the market doesn't care about the environment. It doesn't care about envi uh, the uh, you know inequality. It right. needs to be forced to do so. I'm going to double down. I'm going to say that sustainability helps because actually if you've got the the structure set up to invest in this like we had the fallout of the, the positive fallout of the apollo mission in terms of the tech and uh, growth for the economy that we still see now yes. like the stuff in the iphone came from yes. the state Darpa. investment from the apollo mission yes then yes sustainability is going to solve it all an optimist a good news story. i don't think we're going to completely answer this question obviously yes. um, <laughs> you're right yeah um, i believe i'd like to go back three or four years when money was cheaper and, and have things enforced to see where we are now, you know, because investments in real meaningful change are expensive and the capital is, is more scarce and more expensive now. Um, but it is, uh, markets go up, markets go down. They always have and it's cyclical. And I think what we wanted to highlight today is some of the opportunities that do get exposed when things change. and not to flood for the exits on sustainability and sustainable investment when now is the most important time to do that. So but it's a great question. We had, I think we have time for one more question. I saw one more in, in the back left. Was there still a question back there? Everyone wants a drink. Everyone wants a drink. <laughs> okay, one, one more question here. I have a very brief question, sorry. I'll speak to that That's fine. Um, so my question is sort of a bit of a generalist question, but um, in terms of ESG, how do you guys view companies that are sort of upstream in the supply chain? So in terms of, let's say we're having an energy transition, we're trying to move towards net zero. What about if you need to mine for lithium and you need to do all this kind of stuff? Where does that fit into the ESG sort of sphere? 
if at all? And how do you account for that as a sustainable investment? Do, uh, do you want to go? I want you to go. That's no. such a good question. <laughs> I've sort of forgotten where it fits in quite, but yes. Um, I mean, I, I don't know where it would fit in in various ESG. Um, you know, everyone has their own definition, basically. So where that fits in with various funds or the rest of it. I can certainly say that it is a good question because if you're looking at what is the more sustainable option, for example, is it to mine lithium for an incredibly heavy new electric vehicle no the life cycle assessment would say that to keep hold of your old banger even if it's diesel is probably better than buying a new electric right now the the just for a moment the interesting thing that's going on what f1 formula one is hoping to spin out is drop in um synthetic fuels so if you can if you can run a formula one engine on synthetic fuel uh, fuels made from chemicals, not fossil fuel, plastic, uh, fossil fuel, basically oil, and you can even draw down carbon to make synthetic fuels. If the idea, the win is you could drop that into all road vehicles overnight, and you get thirty billion cars changed like that, carbon emissions down. That is the type of breakthrough thinking that's needed. So, from an LCA's perspective, well, you know, jury's out. It, it, it's not necessarily the better opportunity. Where it sits in ESG. Anyone? I had well, I had a real world example almost directly to this question. I was in the DRC last month watching a panel of the leading mining companies. And the country manager from Barrick is somebody that was a local that got promoted within from the sustainability role into the CEO role managing Barrick's largest mining division, recognized the need for important materials. In, in this case, it was cobalt and invested sought international investment, it received 120 million in international investment to pave into a new area of the DRC where they invested entirely in renewable energy in order to develop uh, one of Barrick's most lucrative assets. So by the grounds of ESG, although it is in an area that is you know, traditionally, and on the panel was another leader of a, a company that just got fined 120 million by, by the DRC for corruption. <laughs> It was it was at least a shining example of the two edges edges of of ESG investment. I think with that we'll we'll move people on. I want to thank the, the esteemed panel. It was it was a great discussion. Hopefully it was worthwhile, and we'll I'll be upstairs for a drink. Vic. Yeah. Thank you.